Hey everyone and welcome to another deep dive. This time we're going way back in time to explore ancient pet cemeteries. It might sound a little unusual. It kind of does, but stick with us. This is way more interesting than it sounds. Absolutely. These burial sites offer us these amazing glimpses into the lives of people and animals from long ago. And how they interacted with each other. Exactly. Okay, so where do we even begin with something like this? Well, like with a lot of our deep dives, we have a fascinating article as a starting point. Right. Our main source is an article from Atlas Obscura. About this site in Berenice, Egypt. That's thought to be the world's oldest designated pet cemetery. Dating back about 2,000 years. Oh. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. So we'll be talking about that a lot, but to get a broader perspective. We'll also be bringing in evidence from other archaeological discoveries. From all over the world. To give you a sense of how humans and animals have interacted. Throughout history. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So what exactly are we trying to uncover in this deep dive? Well, we really want to uncover the stories behind these ancient animal burials. Yeah, like how are these animals cared for? Exactly, what roles did they play in these ancient societies? And how does any of this connect to how we view our pets today? Great questions. So let's start with Berenice. Okay, so Berenice was this bustling port city on the Red Sea. On the coast of Egypt. Right on the coast, yeah. And it was this vital stop on the trade route between the Roman Empire and India. Wow around the first and second centuries AD. And that's where they found the cemetery. Yeah. Just outside the city walls. Dedicated to animals. Entirely to animals. And it wasn't just a couple of burials, right? Oh, no, not at all. This cemetery contained the remains of almost 600 animals. I know. I was reading that and I was like, what? It's pretty mind blowing. It wasn't just cats and dogs either. No, they found monkeys buried there too. Monkeys? Uh-huh. Really? Yeah, and not just any monkeys. What kind of monkeys? Well, these were likely imported from India. From India. All the way from India, yeah. That's so cool. It tells you a lot about the global connections of Berenice. Even back then? Yeah, even then. It makes you think about the stories of these animals. How did they even end up in Egypt? What were their lives like? Exactly. Imagine a monkey traveling all the way from India I know. to this ancient Egyptian port city. It's incredible. So do we know how they got there? Was it like the exotic pet trade or something? That's definitely possible. Monkeys would have been seen as really valuable. And exotic. Too. Super exotic. Especially for wealthy merchants. For Roman officials. Living in Berenice, yeah. Yeah. There's this one burial in particular oh, yeah. that really stands out. What is it? It's a monkey buried with kittens, ah, a piglet, what, and even pieces of cloth tucked into amphorae. Amphorae. You know, those tall, narrow jars. Oh, right, right. You often see in ancient art. That's so interesting. It's like this little family, you know. Yeah, like a snapshot of a multi-species household. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so back to the cemetery itself. Yeah. It's pretty unique compared to other ancient Egyptian animal burial sites. It is. Because weren't the Egyptians like Famous for mummifying animals? They were. And we'll good. definitely talk more about animal mummies later. Okay, good. But what makes Berenice different... Different. ...is that the animals weren't mummified. Huh. They were buried with care. Okay. But in this simpler, more personal way. Interesting. So how do we know that these animals in Berenice were more than just working animals? Yeah. Like, were they cherished companions, like the pets we have today? That's the big question, right? Right. Well, there are clues. Okay. Many of the animals were buried with these items. What kind of items? Collars. Ah. Textiles. Even ceramics placed alongside the bodies. So, like, their favorite things. It seems like it, yeah. Wow. Like, imagine burying a dog. Yeah. With his favorite bowl or a cherished toy. That's amazing. It really does make you think about how much they cared for these animals. It does, doesn't it? And it wasn't just the objects, right? Right. The article mentions that a lot of the animals showed signs of old age uh -huh. and healed injuries. And even toothless animals. Oh. Implying that they were cared for. Even when they couldn't, you know, Rap. earn their keep. Exactly. So that really changes how we think about how ancient people viewed animals. Yeah, it challenges that idea. That they just saw animals as tools or resources. Right. Because clearly they were more than that. They were part of the family. Yeah, they were integrated into daily life. And treated with affection and care. Even when they were old or injured. 
Even then, it really makes you wonder about the individual stories behind yeah. these animals and the people who left them. I know it's fascinating. But before we get ahead of ourselves and start thinking, Berenice is definitely the oldest pet cemetery. Right. The article also mentions some even older dog burials. Yes, from Siberia. Siberia, oh. really? Okay, so the Berenice Cemetery is amazing, and all the but it's not the whole story. No, no, not at all. Because the history of humans interacting with animals goes way further back in time. And all over the globe. So these Siberian dog burials, Yeah. how old are we talking? Over 7,000 years old. Wow, that's truly ancient. It is. Were those Siberian dogs buried with the same kind of care? Some of them were, yeah. Really? Yeah, there's this one site, Shemanka the Second. Shemanka the Second. It's on this hillside overlooking Lake Baikal. Lake Baikal. And archaeologists found a dog buried with the same care What's the it? humans buried there. Wow. It was like a proper funeral. Yeah, exactly. A proper funeral. Yeah. This dog was placed with all sorts of objects. Like what? This beautifully carved antler spoon. An antler spoon. That must have taken hours to create. Wow. So clearly very precious to his human companions. That's amazing to think about. I know. That bond between humans and dogs. 7,000 years ago. Yeah. So were those dogs like purely working animals or were they companions too? It's hard to say for certain, but those Siberian dogs probably would have been essential for hunting. Herding, maybe? Yeah, probably even companionship in that really harsh environment. Yeah, it seems like you can't really draw a hard line between working animal and pet when you're yeah. talking about ancient relationships. I think that's a really good point. It's probably more of a spectrum. Yeah, exactly, a spectrum. Where some animals were valued for their practical skills and others for companionship. And sometimes, like we see in Berenice, yeah. those roles overlapped. Right, so even if Berenice isn't definitively the oldest pet cemetery, right. It still gives us these really valuable insights it does. into how people in the past viewed and interacted with animals. And these Siberian burials push that connection back even further. Exactly, way further. And challenge our assumptions about the history of human-animal bonds. It's really fascinating. It is, but wait, there's more. Oh yeah. The article also mentions even older dog burial sites. Yes, in North America. North America, North America. I had no idea. Okay, tell me more. So in Illinois, Archaeologists discovered the remains of three dogs. How old are these? Buried around 10,000 years ago. 10,000 years, that's mind-blowing. It is pretty incredible. And were they buried with anything, like the dogs in Siberia? These weren't, but yeah. analysis of their bones yeah. suggests they were eating fish. Fish. Yeah, which is pretty unusual for wild dogs. Really? So does that mean they were being fed by humans? It's definitely a possibility. They may have lived near human settlements. And scavenged scraps. Exactly. Or perhaps humans were actively giving them food. Wow. Either way, it suggests this really interesting level of proximity and interaction. Yeah, beyond just coexisting. Exactly. To think about these early interactions between humans and dogs on the North American continent 10,000 years ago. It really is amazing. It really highlights the deep roots of these relationships. In human history and prehistory. But can we go back even further? We can. Really? There's this site in Germany okay. that dates back over 14,000 years. 14,000 years. Seriously? Yeah. That's just, I can't even wrap my head around that. It's hard to imagine. So what's in Germany? It's a quarry. A quarry? Uh-huh. In Bonn Oberkastle. Bonn Oberkastle. And they found two dogs buried there. Two dogs. Alongside humans. Alongside humans. Wow. So do we know anything about those dogs? It's hard to say for sure, mm. but one of the dogs yeah. had skeletal lesions. Lesions? What does that mean? Well, they were indicative of distemper. Distemper? Yeah. Isn't that, like, really serious? It is. And the lesions suggest that this dog suffered from distemper. For a while. For quite some time before its death. Oh, wow. So the fact that it lived as long as it did yeah. means that someone must have been caring for it. Oh, that's heartbreaking, but also I know really touching. It is. That they would care for this animal. Yeah. That was sick. It speaks volumes about the compassion they had. For their animals. Yeah. It really makes you rethink what life was like back then. It really does. These findings suggest that the human impulse to care for animals in need isn't a new thing. Yeah, it's not just a modern thing. It's not. It has really deep roots in our shared history. So we've gone from this potential pet cemetery in Egypt yeah. to dog burials in Siberia, uh, Illinois. And Germany. 
Wow. Ancient humans were burying animals with care all over the world. They were. But here's the thing. Yeah. This wasn't actually the norm in the ancient world. That's right. Deliberate, respectful animal burials like the ones we've been talking about. Yeah. Were actually quite rare. Really? So what happened to most animals when they died? Sadly, most animal remains that archaeologists find are just discarded bones. <sighs> Remnants of meals or sacrifices. Or just animals that died. And were disposed of. Without any special ritual. Right. Wow, so that makes these sites where animals were intentionally buried even more special, even more remarkable. Exactly. It really highlights the significance of these burials. It does, yeah. Because it tells us about human values and beliefs. Yeah, not just about the animals themselves. Yeah. It's about what their burials tell us about it's... us. And it underscores the fact that our modern attitudes towards animals... That deep roots. ...in the past. Yeah. Because we're not the first generation to mourn the loss of our animal companions. Exactly. And feel a connection to them. It's something that's been going on for a very long time. It seems like the more we learn about the past, yeah. the more we realize that those ancient people mm -hmm. weren't so different from us. In so many ways. Especially in their capacity for empathy mm -hmm. and connection with animals. It's really quite remarkable. So we've talked about Berenice, yeah. some incredibly old dog burials. Yeah. But there's one more example I'm really curious about. Okay. This 5,000-year-old cat in China uh, yes. that was eating millet. I know. It's fascinating. So what's the story there? Well, archaeologists were working at a site in Kwanukun in central China, and they found the skeletons of two cats. Two cats? Dating back over 5,000 years. Wow. And one of them had been eating a significant amount of millet. Millet. Yeah. But cats are carnivores, right? Obligate carnivores, yeah. So finding a cat eating millet is... Pretty strange. Super strange. So what was going on? Well, the researchers who analyzed the remains... Yeah. ...think that this cat was being fed by humans. By humans? Yeah. Really? And they also found evidence that this cat lived to a ripe old age. Suggesting? That it was well cared for. So it wasn't just surviving on scraps. No, it was part of the household. Really? And being provided with food. Even though it wasn't a typical carnivore diet. Yeah, exactly. That's so this cat might have started out as pest control. Right, keeping mm -hmm. rodents away from the grain. Exactly. But it ended up being valued for more than just its skills. Right, it hints at a level of care yeah. And maybe even affection. It's like this 5,000-year-old example of yeah. a working animal. Becoming a beloved companion. Exactly. And this reminds us that the history of human-animal interactions is full of surprises. And nuances. It's not always about grand gestures or elaborate burials. Right. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's the small, everyday acts yeah. of care and connection. That reveal the depth of these bonds. Yeah. I love that. It makes you think, doesn't it? It does. About all those individual stories. Yeah. We may never know their full stories. But these remains offer us this glimpse. Into a shared history. Yeah. A reminder of the enduring bond between humans and animals. Well, I think that's a good place to pause for now. Okay. We've covered a lot of ground in this first part of our deep dive. We have. We explored Berenice. Uncovered ancient dog burials. From all over the world. And even met that millet-eating cat. From China. But there's much more to uncover. There is. So stay tuned for part two. Where we'll delve into the cultural context of pet ownership in ancient Rome. And explore that fascinating world of animal mummies. Oh yes, the mummies. And we'll even tackle some of the ethical questions that come up. When studying these ancient relationships. <laughs> so see you there. See you there. Welcome back to our deep dive into ancient pet cemeteries. Last time we were talking about all this evidence of ancient humans burying animals with care. All over the world. From Egypt to Siberia. Even North America. It's amazing how far back those bonds go. It is truly remarkable. So where are we going next on this historical journey? Well, let's head back to ancient Rome. Ancient Rome, okay. Yeah, it was a civilization known for its grandeur. Right. Gladiators, chariots, m massive feasts. Exactly. But beyond all of that, yeah. there was this whole other domestic side to Roman life. Where animals played a role. A significant role, yeah, especially mm -hmm. among the wealthy elite. Pet ownership was common. Quite common, yeah. So what kinds of animals did they keep as pets? Well, it wasn't just tiny lap dogs and exotic birds. Oh, good. I was kind of picturing that. I know, right? Mm. But the Romans actually had quite a diverse range of animal companions. Okay, so tell me more. Well, dogs were highly valued. Their companionship, of course but also for their practical skills. Like hunting. Hunting, guarding, yeah. Were there different breeds back then? There were. Uh -huh. 
And they were bred for specific purposes, much like we do today. So some things never change. What were some of the popular breeds? Well, the sources mention the Laconian and Molossian breeds. Those sound intense. They were known for their hunting and guarding abilities. Yeah, I could see that. But then you had the Melaton. The what? The Melaton, it was this small lap dog. Mm. Probably like the ancient Roman version of a Chihuahua or a Pomeranian. Oh, okay. So like the opposite of those other dogs. Exactly. I can just picture some Roman senator strolling through the forum. Oh, right. With a tiny Melaton tucked under their arm. It's a great image. Were cats popular in ancient Rome, too? They were around, though maybe not as ubiquitous as dogs. I guess that makes sense. But they were definitely appreciated for their pest control skills. Especially in a city like Rome. It's exactly, a bustling city like that. So lots of rodents to keep those cats busy. Exactly. And they do appear in Roman art and literature. Oh, okay. So they weren't totally overlooked as companions. Not at all. Okay, so dogs, cats, Cheka. Uh -huh. What about more exotic pets? Did the Romans have anything like that? Oh, they definitely had a taste for the unusual. Okay, I like where this is going. Birds were incredibly popular. Birds. Especially songbirds like nightingales. Okay. And parrots. Parrots, really? Yeah, they were often kept in these ornate cages. Fancy. Very fancy, yeah. They were seen as symbols of status and refinement. Oh, I bet those parrots could tell some stories. I know, imagine the gossip they overheard. Right, from the Roman Senate. Exactly. Okay, so birds, any other unusual pets? Well, monkeys, of course. Right, like the ones from Berenice. Yeah, it seems like the Romans really like those mischievous primates. They do have a certain charm, I guess. They do, and there are accounts of other exotic animals being kept as pets, too. Really? Like... What here? Well, it's hard to say for sure, but it was probably limited to the very wealthy. Yeah, that makes sense. Like having a monkey or a talking parrot. Yeah was a way to show off your wealth and status. It's like the ancient Roman equivalent of those social media influencers showing off their pet tigers. <laughs> you know, you're not wrong. But beyond that status symbol aspect, yeah. do we know if the Romans actually cared for their pets? Oh, absolutely. We have Roman tombstones and epitaphs. For pets. For pets. And they often mentioned the loved animals. Oh, really? Expressing deep affection and sorrow. Wow, so they really did care for their pets. They did, and some pets were even given elaborate burials. Mm -hmm. Personal items, similar to what we saw in Berenice. So it wasn't just a rich person thing? That's a great question, and something that historians still debate. Oh, okay. There's definitely evidence that pet ownership wasn't limited to the upper classes. Okay. Roman literature and art often depict ordinary people interacting with animals. In ways that suggest companionship. Exactly, and affection. So it seems like this affection for pets wasn't just an elite trend. Right, it probably extended to other levels of Roman society. It's just hard to know for sure how widespread it was. It is, some things are just lost to history. Right, but it seems safe to say that the Romans, at least some of them, definitely really embraced pets as companions. Like we do today. And as we explored earlier, yeah. there's evidence of those strong human-animal bonds in cultures all over the world. Going back thousands of years. It seems like this connection to animals is this common thread throughout human history. That's a great way to put it. And it makes those dog burials in Siberia and that cat with a taste for millet in China even more meaningful. It does, doesn't it? It's like those ancient people were tapping into something fundamental yeah. about our connection to the animal world. They understood something that we're still trying to figure out. And they express that understanding in ways that still resonate with us today. I love that. Those carefully arranged burials. The heartfelt epitaphs. They're not just about individual animals. Ooh, they speak to this shared experience. Right, a recognition of the emotional power of human-animal bonds. So it's not just about finding the oldest pet cemetery. Or the most exotic pet. Right, it's about recognizing this pattern of behavior. This way of relating to animals that has persisted for millennia. Exactly, and it continues to evolve even today. As our understanding of animal cognition and sentience grows. But at its core? It's about recognizing the shared capacity for love, companionship, and grief. That connects us to animals. Beautifully said. Okay, so we've explored the Roman love affair with pets. We have. And touched on those older burial sites. From all over. Is there anything else we should add to this global tapestry of human-animal relationships? Well, there's one more piece of the puzzle we haven't talked about yet. Okay, what is it? Animal mummies. Animal mummies? I thought mummies were just for humans. Nope, not at all. The ancient Egyptians in particular. Yeah. They were known for mummifying animals on a massive scale. Massive? Like how massive? 
We're talking millions of animal mummies. Millions. Seriously. Seriously. Everything from cats and dogs okay. to crocodiles and ibises. Crocodiles and ibises? Why? Oh, I know. It's pretty wild. Were all of those animals beloved pets like we've been talking about? That's where things get a bit more complicated. Okay, I'm intrigued. While some animals were definitely mummified as beloved companions, yeah, many others were part of religious practices and rituals. Oh, okay, so not all animal mummies were created equal. Exactly, and understanding the reasons behind animal mummification is important when we're interpreting those discoveries. Super important. So why were they mummifying all these animals? Well, some animals were seen as manifestations of gods or goddesses. Really? And they were mummified as offerings. Wow. And others were sacrificed as part of religious ceremonies. So the ancient Egyptians had a very different relationship with animals than we do today. They did. Their relationship with animals was really intertwined with their religious beliefs. And their understanding of the afterlife. Exactly. So how do we reconcile this practice of animal mummification? Which sometimes involves sacrifice with the idea that humans were forming loving bonds with animals. It does seem like a contradiction, doesn't it? It kind of does. It's a complex issue. Yeah. And we have to acknowledge that animal sacrifice was part of many ancient cultures. Right. It's something that's really hard to fully understand through a modern lens. That's true, but we can still appreciate the care and artistry that went into creating those mummies. Absolutely. The skill and dedication involved in the mummification process, even for animals, yeah. was remarkable. And they're beautifully preserved. Many of them are, yeah. Giving us a glimpse into the diversity of animal life in ancient Egypt. That's one of the things that makes them so valuable. It's a reminder that these animals, whether they were pets or offerings or sacrifices. They're all living beings. Yeah. That played a role in those ancient societies. And their remains deserve to be treated with respect. I agree. Even if we don't fully understand why they were mummified. Well said. Okay, so we've covered ancient pet cemeteries. Yeah. Roman pet ownership. Uh-huh. And animal mummies. A lot of ground covered. It's clear that human-animal relationships have always been complex and multifaceted. They have. And as we continue to study these relationships... Both past and present. Exactly. We gain a deeper appreciation for how humans and animals have interacted and influenced each other. Throughout history. It's this fascinating and ever-evolving story. It really is. But I think it's time to wrap up part two of our deep dive. Okay. What can our listeners look forward to in part three? Well, in part three, we're going to tackle the big so what question. Okay. We'll explore how these discoveries about ancient relationships with animals <laughs> can actually help us understand animal welfare and conservation efforts today. Sounds thought-provoking. It is. Can't wait to delve into those questions. Me too. Until then, dear listeners, keep pondering those ancient blondes. Welcome back to our deep dive. We've been exploring ancient pet cemeteries and human-animal relationships throughout history. It's been quite a journey. It really has. And now it's time to answer that big, so what question. Right. How does knowing all this about ancient relationships with animals impact us today? Exactly. Like, we've seen all this evidence that people thousands of years ago cared for animals, mourned their loss. Even buried them with their favorite possessions. Exactly. But what can we learn from these ancient interactions? Well, for one, I think it really challenges our assumptions about the history of human-animal interactions. Yeah, like we tend to think of things like animal welfare as a pretty modern concern. Right, like it's a new idea. But we've seen how that's just not true. Yeah, this care and compassion for animals. Goes back millennia. It does. It's kind of mind-blowing. It is, and I think recognizing that shared history yeah. can be a powerful motivator for advocating for better treatment of animals today. Because if people thousands of years ago could recognize the value of animals. Yeah. Surely we can do the same in the 21st century. Absolutely. It sets a pretty high bar for us. It does. But beyond just inspiring us to be better caretakers. Yeah. Are there any practical applications for these archaeological discoveries? There are. Really? Especially when it comes to animal welfare. Okay. Like what? Well, for example, in the field of animal conservation, okay. studying the remains of ancient animals can actually provide really valuable insights. Like how? Well, by analyzing bones and teeth. Even ancient DNA. Even ancient DNA. Scientists can piece together all this information about past animal populations. Like their diets. Diets, migration patterns, even the diseases they faced. Wow, it's like looking back in time. It is, kind of like time travel. To understand how animals lived and interacted with their environment. 
which can then help us protect them today. That makes sense. Yeah, knowing how past populations responded to environmental changes. Like? Like climate change or habitat loss. Yeah. Can give us valuable clues about how modern populations might respond to those same pressures. So it's not just about the past. It's about the future, too. Are there any specific examples of how this information from the past has actually helped animals today? Definitely. Yeah. What? One really fascinating area is the study of ancient DNA. From? Extinct species. Like? Like mammoths or passenger pigeons. Oh, wow. By analyzing this DNA, scientists can learn about the genetic diversity of these populations. And maybe even bring them back to life. That's the idea behind de-extinction. Which is still pretty controversial. It is, but it highlights the potential of archaeology. To inform those cutting-edge conservation efforts. Absolutely. It's amazing how something like digging up old oh, bones... ...can have these huge implications for the future. ...of our planet and all the animals on it. It really shows the importance of collaboration. Between. Archaeologists, geneticists, conservationists... Yeah. ...they can all work together and use this knowledge from the past. To make informed decisions about the present and future. It's all connected. It really is. From those ancient pet cemeteries to modern conservation efforts. It's all part of this bigger story. About human-animal relationships. Exactly. Okay, so as we wrap up this incredible deep dive, yeah. what's the one key takeaway you want our listeners to remember? I think the most important thing is that the bond between humans and animals is ancient and complex and deeply woven into our shared history. And by exploring this bond, we gain a deeper understanding of ourselves, the natural world, and our responsibility to protect it. I love that. It's all connected. It really is. Well, I know I'll never look at a pet cemetery the same way again. You know what you mean. It's not just a place of mourning. It's a testament to those connections. That have spanned millennia. Exactly. And I think they have a lot to teach us, even today. I agree. Thank you so much for taking us on this journey through time. It's been my pleasure. And until next time, keep exploring the wonders of the past, present, and future. And keep learning from those ancient bonds. I will. See you all next time.